I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I know I'm standing between you and happy hour, so I'll try and make it snappy. Um, the, the title of the talk should really be focused on, on educator support, because that, that's, that's what this is all about, is, is helping educators at all levels, teachers, counselors, principals, superintendents, uh, and, and everyone else on the academic side of the house in, in K-12 school districts to, better, um, to, to make better decisions that, that impact students. Uh, I graduated from UT with a bachelor's in computer science. And, and when I started as a freshman, my, my uh, second semester, spring of 96, there was a big thing going on in, in the world, uh, at least as far as nerds were concerned. Uh, <clears throat> there was a tournament, chess tournament, between Gary Kasparov, who at the time was the world chess champion, and a computer called Deep Blue that IBM had created. And uh, I, I love this photo because you see Gary Kasparov on the left and on the right is not a computer. But this man on the right, uh, his whole job is to read the move off of the screen and move the chess piece. Uh, it's like sort of a bionic arm for Deep Blue. But in any case, this was really a big event. I mean, you could see the nerds piled into the auditoriums to, to watch the game. Uh, I wasn't there in person, but certainly following it very closely. And um, you know, the, the, the match, each match is six games. So the first, the first game, uh, the first match rather, Kasparov just knocks it out of the park, um, wins four to two. And IBM asks for a rematch. So a year later, that happens. And that game's actually quite riveting. The, fir the, first, the first game, uh, Kasparov wins. The second is deep blue. And then the next three are draws. So you're entering game six. It's tied two and a half to two and a half. Uh, and uh, deep blue, in the middle of the game, makes a move that the chess community considers absolutely transcendent, meaning they never would have expected it from a computer. And Kasparov clearly feels the same way. He's stunned, loses his concentration, loses the game and the match as a result. Um, and the world chess champion is, for the first time, beaten by a computer. Fast forward to 2005. Um, one of the big chess communities out there, playchess.com, organizes what's called a hybrid chess tournament, where teams of humans and computers can come together and play. And it was widely expected that the winner of the tournament was going to be the best human player paired with the best software out there. And uh, the conclusion was actually quite different, quite shocking to the community. The, the, the team that won was a, a decent but fairly run-of-the-mill chess player paired with software that was good but not exceptional. And, and really what, what the team had spent their time on instead of optimizing the software, which is what everyone else had done to make sure you had the fastest, smartest software out there. This team had focused on the interface between the person and the computer. So the computer is considering multiple options. You know, there's this whole decision tree that they're trying to make. A human being can apply some intuition to that and prune parts of the tree that they know are not going to be relevant here. And that's the team that won. They took the whole thing. You know, that, the, point, the point of the story is really that, that human com computer interface is, is what matters at the end of the day. We talk a lot about wanting to make, to make software that, uh, that is analytically rich, that's powerful, that's brilliant, that shares you know, all these insights. And, and at the end of the day, what really matters is that you're building something that's useful. And, and really, that comes down to, to making sure that you're building systems, whether it's software or visualizations, uh, anything that you are creating that you're putting in front of someone else to try to use and interpret. The, the key is to make sure that they really are uh, readily able to do that. Um, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's about building productive working relationships between humans and computers. And, you know, I, I expect that at some point in the future uh, we will see some you know, dystopian reality like, like you'd see portrayed in the Matrix or in iRobot where, where computers take over the world and, and they treat us as slaves. But in the meantime, uh, the humans are the overlords and uh, we really need to take advantage of that position to make sure that computers are adequately supporting our efforts. Okay, so uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm, I'm going to give you a little background on the context that, that I and Edjuvant uh, work in. Uh, go over some of the key lessons learned and then review some pretty pictures that we found to be particularly powerful and useful uh, with, our, with our customers. 
Um, so as Paul mentioned, uh, I formerly worked as Director of Knowledge Management for San Francisco Unified. And, and really my focus there was on daily data use uh, among K-12 educators at, at all levels. Uh, and, and what I found in working there was a context of what we call DRIP, data rich, information poor. There was plenty of data in the system, but uh, the ability of anyone, anyone, to actually take that data and make, make use of it, make sense of it, um, certainly on a daily basis, but, but even less frequently than that, was extremely limited. And as I looked into the root causes, I found that there were really three barriers that were standing between educators and their ability to work with the data. Number one was that the data systems themselves, and this has come up a bunch, were not only siloed, but they were designed around compliance requirements. So, you know, um, the, the, the IT department or the research department, uh, who, whoever it was that was responsible for reporting data up to the state, making sure that it was accurate and so on, they were, they were well equipped to, to work with those systems, but it, it seemed pretty clear that teachers had never been involved in the process. And in fact, in talking to teachers, that was clearly the case. The, the system was bought and, and put in front of them without their involvement at all. And number two is, and, and this is, I think, a, a, a real irony, uh, the training that teachers had received on using data uh, was, was non-existent in many cases, extremely limited in, in almost all cases. And there's good research out there to back up uh, this perspective is not just San Francisco, this is across the country. National Council on Teacher Quality published a study on uh, the, the quality of teacher prep programs around the country. Department of Education has done some work um, recently on what teachers know when it comes to, uh, to analyzing data, and, and the results are, are really depressing. Um, and so that, that clearly does serve as a real barrier, people's comfort working with data and so on. And then the third, which is the biggest barrier, is time. You know, there, there, there are only so many hours in a day, people are pretty stretched to the max as it is, and if you're asking them to do data analysis on top of what they're already doing, and they're probably not doing data analysis already, uh, then you're going to get some, some real pushback. So uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of lessons learned, and, and this really is lessons learned in the sense that I made some big mistakes uh, going through these processes, and, and so the, the goal is that you don't have to. Um, so the number one lesson learned is, is that you need to partner with users. And, and what I mean by that is you need to be speaking with them directly on an ongoing basis uh, about what it is that you're producing for them to really understand. Um, so I, I don't, have, have people in the room seen the movie Field of Dreams? Well, give me a show of hands if you've seen it. Oh, that's a pretty good representation. Okay, so Kevin Costner is a farmer. He's out in the field one day, and here's the wind whispering, if you build it, he will come. And he does. He goes and plows his land and turns it into a baseball field. Uh, field of Dreams is a, is a really nice movie, but it's a fairy tale. 99% of the time, if you build it, they do not come. <laughs> And, and really, if you, if you follow Kevin Costner's example here, you're going to be a farmer without any crops, um, you know, with, with an expensive but useless field. Uh, so, you know, Steve Blank, I think, summarizes this pretty well. This is, this is a um, Stanford Business School professor who, who has written one of the, the primary um, uh, manifestos around uh, startups and how to, how to run them efficiently. And, and he makes the point that there are no facts inside your building. And what he's saying there is get out and talk to people because whatever it is that you think is their reality, you're probably not right. In fact, you're almost certainly not right. Uh, and, and you know, the, people have a tendency to expect that what they believe is what is typically believed. It's called a false consensus bias. Um, and it's tough for people also to wrap their heads around the notion that something that seems so intuitively true to them uh, is, is not. So just to give you an example, and a little more evidence that none of you are really thinking clearly. Um, show of hands again, who here has ever driven a car? Okay, keep, keep your hands up. Uh, if you know, you, you, you've been on the road, you've seen all these terrible drivers out there, keep your hands up if you are an above average driver. I think two hands went down. <laughs> People are very self-aware. So this, this is a different cognitive bias called illusorous superiority, sometimes referred to as the Lake Wobegon effect after <laughs> Garrison Keillor's 
uh, uh, show in which all the children are above average. Um, people have this perception. So you really do need to talk to other people in order to stand, understand clearly how they perceive the world. Don't trust your instincts. Um, an example of this, when, when we were building one of our first products, which was a dashboard for principals, we interviewed about 50 principals one-on-one uh, -on -one, to understand what kind of data they were using right now, what they wanted to be using, and so on. And one thing that came up over and over again that we hadn't even considered was the weather. Turns out weather has an impact on a bunch of logistics in a school, especially if you're in a place like Chicago. Uh, you're going to staff your cafeteria differently. Your gym has to be open because your field's not going to be useful. Your buses are going to run late. A bunch of people are going to be absent. I mean, it goes on and on. And so, so rather than go to weather.com, uh, because there wasn't enough time to do that, principals just wanted to have this in front of them. Um, and that was a feature they really appreciated. How, how do you do this in terms of talking to users? I mean, it's, not, it, it's actually pretty straightforward. You, you only need to talk to five people in order to get about 80% of the insights that you're going to get. You need to talk to them one-on-one -on -one instead of in a focus group, because focus groups create groupthink, and that's not all that useful. Um, but really, it's not a big deal. I mean, you can, you can very inexpensively uh, expose usability problems in, in whatever it is you're delivering. And you know, I'm, I'm emphasizing this point so heavily just because I have made this mistake. It's really painful. Um, did work on um, on a product for teachers that was that involved collaboration directly with the administrative team, and there were no teachers involved in the process. And we built this thing that was really nice. Everyone agreed was going to be great, but we, when we actually rolled it out and talked to the teachers. Big surprise, you know, it wasn't 180 degrees off of where we needed to be, but it, but it was a lot farther than anyone was happy with. Uh, and that's really painful. You know, another way to think about this is that you want to fail fast. If something's not going to work, you want to know about it today because it's exponentially more costly to fix it once you've gone down the path of, of building it all out. Okay, so um, number two lesson learned is embrace constraints. So, you know, uh, um, a lot of times people walk into a problem very optimistically and, and, and eager to, to fix whatever the world is that they're playing in, and, and they just run into a wall over and over and over again. And, and this, I think, is particularly the case in education. I mean, these are big bureaucratic institutions, uh, and they're not going to move for you, most likely. And, and what we've found has really helped us to, to move forward. Uh, with these folks is just to say, okay, these are constraints, we're going to embrace them, and instead of trying to find some way around them, we're going to, to build on top of them. Uh, and in a lot of ways, from a, from a design perspective, constraints are a blessing. They tell you what you don't have to worry about. They make decisions for you, uh, so that you can focus your efforts on, on decisions that are more likely to be acceptable and, and accepted. Uh, so just to give you a couple examples, because constraints come in a lot of different forms. Um, but I'll give, you, I'll give you an example of political constraint and then uh, an, an infrastructural constraint. Political constraint, w when we released uh, that, that first version of the principal dashboard, we included a ranked list of teachers in the school. And um, we didn't actually take it very lightly. We spoke with the labor relations folks and made sure that it was kosher to do that with, with, uh, with principals. And it was. It was outside of the constraints of the, the union agreement. But, uh, you know, I mean, w w as soon as the superintendent heard about it, he, he uh, objected immediately and told us we couldn't do that because at least the perception of it was going to be that, um, you know, like across, uh, as is the case across the country, that, that this is going to create problems with the union. And, and so that, that was canned, um, not, not until we'd done a, a good bit of work on it. Uh, an example of an infrastructural constraint is, uh, as I mentioned before, teachers really lack comfort and training in, in working with data. And, and this is a fundamental problem for our business. I mean, we're putting uh, analytical insights in front of teachers. And, and in a lot of cases, that involves looking at data. Uh, you can't just translate it into a simple English language sentence all the time. And people shut off when you do that in a lot of cases. Uh, and so what we did was we built a simple course on using data, sort of data analysis 101 for teachers put it online, made it free. Um, it, it meets teachers where they are, and it accommodates their, their time availability by 
um, providing the lessons in the form of what we term drip learning, after drip irrigation. So you get a little bit every day for about a three week period. About a 15 minute lesson that gives you a hands on, a, a, a usable skill in analyzing data. Uh, and we just got accredited a couple weeks ago for uh, continuing education credits in Texas. Um, Okay, the, the third and, and last lesson learned that I want to share with you is that uh, particularly when you're working with data and sharing that with people, you need to surprise people. When we roll out dashboard implementations, uh, even when we were first doing this, universally we saw a lot of enthusiasm. And, and that came in the form of both people talking about the product, how useful it was, that they had all this new data they'd never seen before, or in forms that they weren't able to access it. And, and it shows up in the form of logins, so we could see tons of people were logging in multiple times a day. Uh, and, and, you know, th this, this shows up in, in, in other ways as well. We had a superintendent in the first day of an implementation call and argue about the attendance rate that was showing up because she thought it was far lower than, than it actually was. I mean, this was this is fundamental, right? I mean, attendance is tied to instruction, it's tied to budgets. You know, if there's one thing that, that you're on top of uh, as a superintendent at a district, it's that. Um, so this was really surprising. I mean, even, even something as basic as that. But a few weeks later, people are logging in once a day. A few months later, they're logging in once a week. Half a year later, it's once every other week. And so we go back to the principals, the teachers who are using these systems, and we say, what happened? You know, you were so enthusiastic, and now you're barely even using this thing. Is it, is it not as useful as you thought? And they say, no, it's useful. You know, we didn't have this data before, but we're not surprised anymore. The first time they saw the data, there were all sorts of patterns and trends that they saw that were new to them. But those patterns and trends are not radically changing over time. You know, you look as a simple example in an attendance trend line, day after day you get a little extra line segment on the end of it, but it's not radically fluctuating. And if you're looking at that data every day, you start to get pretty bored. You start to develop a sort of visual fatigue around the data that's there. And, you know, that, that probably makes some good sense intuitively, you know. Uh, would you use Facebook if every time you logged in you saw the same people? You know, just a new breakfast update from Ben Glazer? You'd stop going in a hurry, right? I mean, Facebook would be dead. Mark Zuckerberg would be a zillionaire. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that actually is what most dashboards are doing, right? I mean, they're showing you the same kinds of data over and over. And, on a daily basis at least, maybe annually that's useful. It's useful for a board to see those big picture trends or for a principal to understand how those are trending through a school so that you can make big picture strategic decisions or policy decisions. On a daily basis, it's pretty worthless. Uh, and you know what we see is that people don't use those systems in practice nearly as frequently as, as you would expect or as we would want them to. So let me show you some of the some of the uh, the pretty pictures that we've that we've come up with. So and, and I'll specifically start with that last point about about surprising people. This was a big problem for us. You know, we were a dashboard company. We integrate data from all these different data systems, and the value that we offer was putting it up on a screen all together in a holistic kind of way. And people w weren't using that. So we took a step back and went went to the drawing board. And, and you know, when we looked at the data, there were interesting things happening with individual students. You know, a student who'd been, who'd been really struggling all of a sudden was doing better. But that would happen around the same time as a student who was doing really well, sort of falling off a map. And those patterns would cancel each other out. And, and, and so, um, so what, we, what we decided to do was to build an engine that would apply different kinds of analyses all the time as the data was coming in and find those individual students or student subgroups, the needles and the haystacks uh, that, that on aggregate were being, were being canceled out, were being uh, silenced in the mix. And so this is an example of an insight. What we do is we generate a continuous Facebook-like feed of insights about students. 
each one of which is clickable, and this is the blow up when you click on one. So it, it gives you information about the student. And notice, notice that in this case, we're not finding a student who has a poor attendance record. We're finding a student whose attendance pattern has changed recently. Now this is what you need to know on a daily basis. You know the students who don't show up very often, but you don't necessarily notice the student who's, who's shifting the moment it happens. And that's the opportunity to actually do something about it. Uh, to, to, to step in, intervene, find out why the student's not, be, not coming to class, follow up with the parents, and so on. Um, and the, the idea here is to really promote a full data inquiry cycle. Instead of just giving people data and putting the entire onus of the analysis and the follow-up actions on the shoulders of, of educators, what we're trying to do here is to find the places that are actionable in the data for them. Instead of giving them a blank slate, say, okay, these are patterns. These are inflection points that are really significant or outliers that are significant. And, and use that as a starting point. You know, maybe there's nothing there. Maybe you know why the student's on. Maybe, maybe Anna caught the flu, and that's why she's missed the last week. But maybe it's something else. And, and the idea is to be able to take the, the, the sort of data science uh, that, that, that's possible with the data that's already being collected and bring it to the teacher so that the teacher can then apply the art of instruction and triangulate that with, with the science. Here, here's another visualization that people seem to really get a lot out of. And, and this is actually two different visualizations, but using the same thing. So this is an annual school calendar. Um, the, the, the idea here, we saw a similar visualization earlier in the day, but the idea is that each row is a day of the week. Each column is a different week. So moving from left to right, you start in August, go all the way to June. And in and, and the top visualization, this is, a, this is an annual view of attendance at a classroom level. The green is above 95%, the yellow is between 90 and 95, and the red is um, below 90%. And you can see this pattern really easily when you display this way. I mean, m most student information systems would, would expose this at best as a list of dates and attendance rates uh, in a text tabular format. But here you can see that the year started off uh, with, with very good attendance overall. And as we got closer to the winter break, things started to go a bit downhill, didn't quite recover after students returned, but um, you know, got a bit better uh, moving more into the second semester. So again, this is something that you can, that you can look at um, more in a big picture context, but but you know, if you see a pattern over the last week, there's, there's a conversation that you can have with your department chair, with your principal, to, to try and fix the problem. Uh, the, second, the second visualization is taking that, that same calendar, obviously, but instead of applying it to aggregate data, this is a visualization for an individual student. And it's, it's really dense with, with information. There, there are two, two, well, three pieces of, of data here. Number one is absences, which are the dark red squares. Number two, is positive behaviors that a teacher has made note of. Uh, and those are the pink squares. And then the, the light green squares, uh, I'm sorry, the light pink squares are negative behaviors. Now this is happening in a, in a context of, um, of a charter school that's collecting a tremendous amount of granular uh, data about student behavior. I mean, you can see there's almost a data point per day for each student. But this is a really rich view that, that helps you identify where there are correlations between behaviors and, and attendance patterns uh, and, and just see the, the pattern really easily uh, in a very compact space. The last thing that, that I want to talk to you about in terms of the visualizations, and this is a couple of visualizations, but specifically around blended learning. We, we've done a lot of work in this area um, in part in response to seeing that in traditional contexts. It's actually tough to get instructional data that teachers can apply right away on a, on a daily basis. You know, schools just aren't at the point where they're collecting the instructional data that frequently. Grades are about as close as you get in most places, but grades are something that teachers feel at least like they have uh, a very good intuitive sense for. They're grading the papers, they're entering them into a grade book. Um, blended is a really different context. Teachers are very disconnected from the data. By definition, students are essentially entering it directly into the computer. Uh, and in addition, students are oftentimes working at different places. So it's not like everyone's even moving in lockstep. 
So it's, it's, a, it's a very different role uh, for a teacher and the visualization of the, that data, the, the ability to access it and make sense of it becomes all that much more important. So this is uh, a, a part of a visualization that we made for a product called iReady that shows how students are progressing through the various parts of the, the curriculum that, that iReady provides. Um, white, square, white circles are un, unattempted, green is passed, and red is failed. And you can, you can you know, click on any of these to see specifically what the score was and the topic. But teachers who use the blended tools tend to be pretty familiar with the sequence of the, of the, the units, the instructional content, and so on. And what we found is this, this is one tool that, that teachers are putting students in front of. And there are lots of them out there. And they all think about instruction and data in different ways. They all have their own dashboards. Um, the granularity of a unit of instruction varies. And so you can't just take all the outputs from all these different systems and put them into a big melting pot and treat them all the same. You really do need to look at, look at them separately by tool. But what you can do is make sure that the way that you communicate that data, the way that you visualize it, is consistent across those tools. And that's, that's really what, we, what we've done here. Um, in addition to that, a lot of these systems provide time on task data. So you can see for each student not just what they've completed, but how long it's taken them to do that. And when you combine that, you, you, can, you can get some, some interesting visualizations to see progress rates of students. Uh, and, and applying this to the insight cards, you know, that, that, that ongoing analytical process that's mining the data for insights, we can notice when there's an inflection point in the progress rate right, through instructional content, which, which acts essentially as a proxy for student engagement with the content. So even if a teacher's not in the room, seeing which students are paying attention and not, you can, you can get a lot of insight out of just looking at this data in, in relatively straightforward ways. So I just want to, that, that's, that's the content that I have. I wanted to, to recommend a couple books for folks who are interested in going down some of these paths. On the left is Information Dashboard Design um, by Stephen Few, just released a, a second edition. This is my Bible on visualizing information uh, on, on, on a, a, a consolidated single screen format. <coughs> And then the other is Rocket Surgery Made Easy, which, which offers a really useful guide to doing those usability studies on the cheap and very efficiently by Steve Krug. Um, and and just, to, just to go back, I, you know, I mentioned in the story about, about the chess playing computer, Deep Blue, that there was in, this, in the very last game this, this brilliant transcendent move that the, the computer played. Turns out it was a bug in the software. The computer was doing something that the programmers had not intended it to do. And it sort of accidentally picked a, picked a move that shocked the chess world and probably cost Kasparov the game. Uh, and, and in a way, I find this very encouraging um, because, because it really underscores the point that, that uh, you know, th this is all about human creation. This is all about, all within our, our grasp to, to, to take advantage, do something about it. Uh, and you know, we're, we're here to support the work of, of de dedicated educators, uh, you know, making sure that we're, that we're putting the right inf information in front of them so they can make better decisions. But we need to make sure that we do it in a way that, that really takes advantage of their humanness, first and foremost, that complements rather than supplements uh, their, their abilities. Thanks very much.